Good evening, Starville Church. Hope that you've had a great week so far. Trust that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday have gone well. We're at our Wednesday evening service together, and I'd like to just open up with reading from Psalm 95. Right at the beginning of the chapter, it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful no noise to him with songs of praise. And I'd like to encourage you to sing during our time tonight. It says sing and make a jo joyful noise to him. It doesn't say you've got to do it clearly with a great voice, impressively to others. It says just do it joyfully. And we want to come before the Lord joyfully tonight. So in a few minutes, they're going to lead us into some songs of praise and worship. And I want to encourage you, sing to the Lord. Sing to him with a joyful voice. Let's go to him in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful. Lord, you are faithful to each and every one of us. And Lord, we just ask that you would be in this service tonight. Lord, we're going to enter into praise tonight. We are going to sing. We're going to make a joyful noise. A joyful noise to you. We just ask that you would be in this place, that you in, would inhabit our praises in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Join us as we worship. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning.
Let's pray for the service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you thankful. And Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your goodness to us. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for uh, the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we ask for the service that you'll move upon hearts and that you'll move upon words to penetrate our hearts, to uh, give us the grace and the strength and the faithfulness to walk uprightly before you in this day and the days ahead. Bless the service, Lord, we pray. Uh, let your anointing be upon it, and we ask these things in Jesus' name and give thanks. Amen. Hi, this is the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimal, Dalet, Hey. Vav, Zayin, Het, Tet, Yud, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ayin, Peh, Tzadi, Kuf, Resh, Shin, Tav. Good evening. Welcome back to our study on Psalm 119. Tonight we will be looking at the 19th stanza. As we've been learning, each stanza corresponds to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and this portion of scripture is titled Kuf. So let's take a look at our portion of scripture tonight and read through it. In Psalm chapter 119, verse 145 to 152, from the English Standard Version, we read, With my whole heart I cry, Answer me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. 
I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. So this is our first segment on this stanza of Kuf. So as part of our study, we like to give the meaning and cultural significance of the letter. And it's something unique to the Hebrew alphabet that our alphabet doesn't have. And then we'll consider some general thoughts on this stanza as a broad overview. So the letter Kuf, or it's also spelled Q-O-O-P-H, pronounced Kuf. It's an alternate spelling to the one you may have seen on the screen. Now some translations have it spelled as Kuf and some as Kuf. Sounds the same, spelled a little different. You may see it spelled differently at different times, but it's the same letter. Now Psalm 119 is widely considered to be written by David himself, and perhaps it was even written for his son, Solomon, as a psalm that would teach him his ABCs and also the ways of the Lord at the same time. This was the original purpose of Psalm 119. So I just want to interject this thought that what a simple but brilliant idea this really is, using something as basic as the ABCs to teach your children God's ways. It just reminds me that God intends his word and his ways to be part of every aspect of our lives. You know, we, we tend to separate, especially with education. This is secular education. This is biblical education. But this kind of challenges me to consider how can I be incorporating God's word and his ways into the most common or basic areas of my life? You know, we call the ABCs the basic foundation of our education. And it just reminds us God wants his ways to be foundational in our lives and also part of even those most basic aspects of life. So, back to Kuf. Now, Kuf has a numerical value of 100, and we hear the number 100 repeated throughout many scriptures. Specifically, we see 100 in the concept of bringing forth 100-fold. Now, the parables of the Lord repeat the phrase of bringing forth fruit to the amount of 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And now, that's a sermon in and of itself, but the idea is that we want to allow the Lord to work in our lives and use us in such a way that we bring forth fruit for His kingdom. And we want to be those who bring 100-fold. And you might think that means 100 times the original seed, but can actually be even greater than that. 100-fold really means the greatest return possible. And that's what God is looking for in us. So let's take a look at the letter tonight. Now, the letter is shaped something like this. And it has three particular meanings. Holiness, the eye of the needle, and the nape of the neck. And from this image, you can kind of see where they draw the idea of the eye of the needle and the nape of the neck, it looking like the back of a head. Now, there would be plenty of take-home points on just holiness alone, but let's take a brief look at each of these three meanings and where else we find them in Scripture. So first, that idea of holiness. It's to be separated from the world and also separated unto Christ. Something or someone is set apart to be used for God's plan and purposes. And in the tabernacle of Moses, that meant items were consecrated and devoted solely for the use of service to God and not to be used in a common way. Now, if we were all as uncomplicated as a plate, we would be washed, set aside, used only for worship. That sounds simple enough, but we are far more complex than a dinner plate. And if we're using that example, let's be honest and admit that sometimes we even just use paper plates because we want to make our life that much more simple, but we're not plates. So holiness isn't as black and white, and it's an ongoing work in our lives, something that can only be accomplished through continual consecration of our lives, that work of grace, allowing God into every area of our lives, and then with his help, choosing to walk in a way that honors him and reflects that we've been separated from the world and set apart to God. Next, let's take a look at the second meaning of kuf, the eye of a needle. The first scripture that comes to our mind is the one that talks about a camel passing through the eye of a needle. And we find this in Matthew chapter 19. Now here, a rich young ruler asks Jesus what he can do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus runs through a list of commandments, and the young ruler says, you know, I've always kept these, which is really quite impressive that he has. And he says, so what else must I do? And Jesus tells him, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And in verse 22, we read, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, I've heard people say his possessions had him. But then in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, Jesus speaks the well-known verse. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, 
Jesus wasn't saying that it's impossible for a rich person to enter heaven. He was simply saying that it's impossible to get to heaven by our own works. Now here in this story, the route the rich young ruler tried to take was the easy way out. He didn't want to part from his wealth. He wanted to hear anything but that. But that was the one thing that would cause him to miss out on what God really had for him. You know, we can't buy our way into heaven and we can't do enough good works to earn a place there. It's by grace alone. Not our works, but a work of grace. And it's also a warning or, you know, a reminder to us of not putting anything or anyone before God. You know, maybe it would be easy for you to sell everything and go live the simple van or RV life. You know, that's kind of trendy right now. Uh, maybe fill in this part of the story to fit your own situation. It might not be sell all you have, but he'll ask you to surrender that something or that someone because God knows that is what's keeping you from full surrender to following him. Finances are a big one because I think we don't realize just how much we are trusting in our paycheck until we don't actually have one. You face financial hardship and you find out real quick how much you trust God to be your provider. But it doesn't necessarily have to be money or even a thing. A possession can be just about anything, mm -hmm. including a relationship, a love for an activity, or a dream you have for the future. You know, whenever we sing that song, All to Jesus I Surrender, I always sing it with a little bit of trepidation and kind of that battle in your flesh and your spirit, a little struggle there, because I know what it feels like when Jesus puts his finger on something in my life and asks me mm -hmm. to give it up to follow him. And if you've followed Jesus for even a week, I think you know this experience to some extent. And I've had times where it was a physical thing that I had to be willing to get rid of it or, um, you know, let it go. But more often than not, it seems to be something that, you know, no one else would ever have to know about. But God is saying, will you surrender this to me? Will you surrender this to follow me? Or you could say, so that you can be closer to me. And I've always kind of felt for that rich young ruler because I know how many times I couldn't surrender something the first time God asked me. But he's so merciful, isn't he? And it gives me hope that, you know, just maybe that guy walked away sorrowful, yes, but maybe he let those words of Jesus work in his life. So that somewhere along the way, and I'm, I'm not trying to add to scripture here or elaborate on the story, I'm just saying, Maybe we didn't hear the end of the story, and maybe he did eventually respond. Mm -hmm. Because I know, kind of like us, you know, there's an altar call, and pastor has to say, anyone else? Anyone else? You know, like five times, and then finally we relent, and I should say we finally repent, right? Now, there is also an interesting theory many theologians believe that the eye of a needle is a reference to a gate with the same name, the eye of a needle, found in the city of Jerusalem in the first century. And they say that this gate named the Eye of a Needle was so small that anyone that hoped to get a camel through would have to take all of their baggage off the camel, get the camel down on its knees, and have the camel crawl through the gate. And that gives us quite a picture of a low and narrow place. And when we tie it back to that thought of being able to enter into God's kingdom, in Matthew 19, verse 24, where it says, it is easier for a camel to go through the Eye of a Needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, it paints a picture of approaching God in humility, being on our knees, bowing in reverence to him, or being on our knees in prayer, continuously going to the Lord, relying on him for our needs and trusting him. Because all the baggage had to come off the camel to get through, and all the supplies that they had carried to provide for themselves would not get them through that eye of a needle. Just brings us back to that thought that, what do we have to surrender in order to enter into the kingdom? or in order to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. In Hebrews 12, 1, it tells us that we have to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And it's not because God's a cruel master. It's because he's a loving Heavenly Father that doesn't want us hindered carrying things that we don't need. And now lastly, the third meaning of kuf, the nape of the neck. Now this is the back or the base of your neck, right about where the hairline begins. Now, many of us have heard the expression that the man is the head of the house. And that's real nice and that's true. But we have also heard that old humor saying that a woman is the neck that turns the head. And I wanna kinda of go down that train of thought for just a moment to point to the nape of the neck, which deserves some attention. Now in Joshua chapter 15, there is a portion of scriptures speaking about Caleb occupying the land. And beginning in verse 16, we read, And Caleb said, He who attacks Kirjath-sephir and takes it, 
To him I will give Aixa, my daughter, as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aixa, his daughter, as wife. Now it was so, when she came to him, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? And she answered, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me the land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now Aixa persuaded her husband, Othniel, to ask her father for a field. So she urged him or moved him to act. She persuaded him to step out. She was the neck that turned the head. And might I point out that she did it for good because we use that saying in a joking way a lot, but we all know it's true that the wife has a great influence on her husband's decisions. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that this is a positive example of that, not a controlling woman, but a woman of influence who was able to persuade her husband for the blessing of them both, and presumably for generations to come. So she moved her husband to act, and then we see she got down off her donkey to humbly yet boldly speak up and ask her dad for more. And in this interaction, we see her father Caleb's heart was toward her when she approached him in this way. And you know, it moves the heart of our Heavenly Father, you know, Father God, when we come to him humbly and ask for his blessing and provision of the things that we need. She asked for a blessing of a spring of water, and we see Caleb's heart was so touched that he blessed her with the upper and the lower springs. She received a double portion that day. And this might have been, you know, just a short interaction, but this inheritance had far-reaching effects for the rest of her life, giving her and her family a portion that would bless them for generations. You know, it's important how we come to the Lord. He deserves our reverence and humility. But what about coming boldly and with it an expectation? You know, she persuaded her husband, Othniel, to ask for a field, and he got it. But a field needs water, right? And we can and should come to the Lord often for those things that we need, every day, every hour, every minute. But understand the importance of how we come to him. Aixa is a good example. Come humbly, boldly, and sincerely. And we also want to remember he is our loving Heavenly Father. I don't know what kind of father Caleb was. Not everyone has had the best example of a loving father in their lives. And this can really affect how we view the Lord, especially if we're coming to him to ask for something. But Jesus assur assures us that if we ask for bread, he won't give us a stone. He doesn't trick us or tease us or, you know, intentionally withhold things like maybe an earthly father has done. He doesn't act selfishly or purposefully hurt us. He loves us. That's right. It's so basic, right? It's so simple. But I really think we forget it sometimes. You know, his banner over me, over you, over us, it's love. So his motive is always love. And we want to let that sink in so that it can transform our mindset and transform our approach when we come to God. He wants to help us. And he wants to bless us more than what we even think to ask for. And now David, the author of the Psalms, was no stranger to crying out to God, asking for help, asking for his blessing. Oftentimes the Lord is probably just waiting for us to ask so that he can pour out his blessing that he wants to give us. It's a matter of, you know, simply coming humbly, boldly even, and asking. You know, he's never too busy for us. Also, a few last thoughts about the neck. Some word origins relate it to the idea of being stiff-necked, and scripturally, we associate this with being proud or stubborn or not teachable. Basically, it's the opposite of all the things we just said about being humble and lowly. Now, if you're stiff-necked, stubborn in your thinking or ways, and unwilling to bow low or be humble, you're not getting through that eye of a needle. When we're unteachable, rigid, or inflexible, it's very difficult for God to use us. We're going to have to be flexible to flow with the Spirit wherever or whenever He may lead. Now, Proverbs also mentions the neck in Proverbs 3, verse 3, where it says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Now, I picture a necklace worn like jewelry here, hanging around the neck. Now, people wear crosses and symbolic or memorable tokens on necklaces as constant reminders to themselves. And Proverbs is telling us steadfast love and faithfulness are the things that should be adorning us. Those are what we should be wearing not just symbolically, but showing through our words and actions that we are decorated with them, so to speak, to be those that are clad with love and faithfulness, and to be those where others are encouraged to see that faithfulness in us and to feel that love from us. So that's an overview of kuf with its three meanings, basically holiness, and then that thought of humility with the eye of the needle and the nape of the neck. 
Now we'll be back and we're going to delve deeper into these truths found in the stanza of Kuf. May the Lord bless you. Thank you, Kenan Hill, for that message on what the Bible says about Psalm 119, verses 145 through 152, the section called Kuf. And they emphasize three points about that character t- this evening. First, holiness. Holiness is being separated from the world. But there's a second part to that. It's being separated unto Christ, unto his will, unto his bidding. It's an ongoing work in our lives, and there are steps of holiness that each of us need to take, that our lives are separated unto him. Second, they talked about the eye of the needle. It's impossible to get to heaven on our own works. We need to give things up to make it through to get to enter in. We need his grace to do his good will. Will we surrender to what he's requesting so we can have that, be in that place of humility and receive that grace from him? The third point they made was on the nape of the neck. And we see that influencers have an opportunity to ask and act for more. But also just that point, narrowing down, we want to come humbly and boldly to the Lord, asking him for a blessing that he would even turn towards us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this message tonight. And Lord, we want to be taught by you. Lord, we want your holiness to be worked in our lives. And Lord, for that to happen, there are things we need to yield to you that we could receive that that grace from you that is necessary. Lord, that we would even ask for a blessing from you that you would touch us that we could see your purposes fulfilled. Lord, we just ask that you'd move in us tonight, speak to our hearts the rest of this week, touch us as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.